You're tuned in to the Behind the Scenes Podcast with your host, Man Robinson, the place where educational, motivational, and inspiration collide with innovation. Be entertained while learning from some of the best actors, directors, and producers in the industry today with self-help tips that you can apply in your career. We don't just talk about it, we be about it. Okay, so welcome back to another episode of Behind the Scenes. I'm your host, Mayor Robinson, and today's climate has us in a in a in a space that we we've been in for a long time, but we are looking at it face to face, and we have a creator by the name of Mr. Chad Lawson Cooper, who actually was inspired to do a story very relatable to the situation in hand, and turned it into a movie. It's actually been a play for years. It's called Justice on Trial, the play. And we were able to complete the movie and the movie is called the same thing, Justice on Trial. So with us today, we do have Chad Lawson Cooper, as I mentioned. We have Reverend Rudolph McKissick. We have the great legend, Harry Lennox, Mr. Harry Lennox, and another Mm -hmm. great legend by the name of Todd Bridges. And we also going to have one of the main actors come on, Mr. John. I'm going to say his name wrong, Chad. You got to help me. John Gesman, one of the main characters. So, like I said, I'm Mayor Robinson, and this is how we're going to start. So, Mr. Chad lost the group. Yes, sir. I, I know the story. I was there during the filming of the film, of course. Yeah, and you, t- you were able to touch on not just one problem that we had as African-Americans, but damn near all of them in that film. Yes. Can you tell us how and why you even came up with it from the first thought to be able to put that energy into doing that, make writing what you wrote? Well, I can tell you very vividly. It started in twi- in 2016 <clears throat> um, after um, it was the day, rather, the day that uh, Philando Castell was murdered by a cop um, in Minnesota. Prior to that, I just pretty much did productions in the uh, in the Christian uh, genre, and uh, that particular day it changed the whole trajectory of what I do. And I went into social justice. I, I sat in Cracker Barrel <clears throat> that day. I was in the D.C. area and happened to see it on my phone. And it brought me to tears in the in the middle of Cracker Barrel as, as I was sitting there with, uh, I probably was the only black person <laughs> there, but to see this white police shoot this guy for nothing in front of his daughter and his fiance. And I said, oh my God, that could be me. That could be my son. That could be my daughter in the car with him. And and, and it just, it, it, I weep that day. and. And that, from that day, the idea of justice on trial, Black Lives Matter 2 was the play, um, T-O-O, was birthed. And um, it took me about eight months. I was pretty much in exile in Wilmington, Delaware, <clears throat> at a friend's house. And, uh, and, and while I was writing it and going through the motions, um, I cried. I went through every emotional uh, aspect of writing, and and I know Harry, the writer, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you a writer as well, man. So yes. you know, I pretty much lived it, and 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 so when we debuted it the first time, it was at Medgar Evers University in um in in New York, in Brooklyn, and so it it it, it was that was special in itself because of course you know the the movie as well as well as the play deals with two civil rights attorneys suing the u.s justice department for reparations and damages ongoing damages done to african americans and we bring back time traveler witnesses like harriet tubman medgar evers and emmett teal in full character and they tell their stories on a witness stand to a, a modern day mixed jury, black, white, Hispanic. And then they have the conversation that the America is on the precipice of having right now. And uh, so it's a much needed conversation that we that we had implemented through art um, 
three years prior to to all of this happening. And so um, when we debuted it at Medgar Evers, it's the only production that um, I've ever produced or, or, or been a part of the writing of it that I have not really starred in myself. So I wanted to sit in the audience to see what the audience was really going to say and do. And man, when I sat in the audience and, and the production was going on, I mean, people were screaming, they were they were hollering, they were yelling. You know, and um, David Arquillo is a is a is a great actor too, who plays the antagonist, the lawyer for the uh, Department mm-hmm. of Justice. They was mm-hmm. cussing him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, wow, this this thing is real. That is definitely yeah. That's that's definitely happens in black in black uh, plays. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he and he said, uh, you know, he, he in one part of the script he said, so what are we supposed to do? Just go passing out the cash to every black person that we see? You get some, you get some, you get some. Where's Oprah when we need her? <laughs> so the audience was <laughs> like. H yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, wow. yeah, and so I knew then that it was a it was a game changer. Um, then, yeah. you know, after we ran it at the Signature Theater, uh, which is a registered Off Broadway theater on Forty Second in New York, um, we we took it to Brooklyn and ran it off off Broadway for a, while, a long time. <laughs> And every, every time we would run it, it, it would just be absolutely jam packed. So we decided we would take it on tour to select cities. And, and we were selling out around the country. I mean, Birmingham, Alabama, 3,800 people, all the way to Los Angeles, the Wheelchair Ebell Theater. And Todd, you were at that show, yeah. jam packed. The lines wrapped around the building. And the same response everywhere that we would take it. And so then it turns into a movie. Um, I had the uh, fortuitous pleasure of meeting uh, Burke Management, Vanzel Burke, and we went to the same school. And uh, I actually had to sing at his church, and he came by and sat by me, and I was like, who is this stuck-up Negro? <laughs> 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 I said, I'm not in the mood today. And so he happened to see Fam you on the back of my phone my my card holder he was like what you know about that school and i said well that's my school that's my school too so we we ended up talking and and uh and and it turned into a very healthy relationship um relating to uh the movie portion and that's how of course todd got involved and uh he played a wonderful wonderful civil rights attorney um you know when you're just a pro you're just a pro he 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 did his thing, and uh, and then uh, then of of course uh, Harry and I uh, met by way of Justice on Trial too, and, uh, and, and so he's an executive producer, and and we're doing several movies and projects together as well, and just to have his expertise is is priceless. Um, you know, he's just I call him the. The Archbishop of Hollywood, <laughs> so, <laughs> and and, uh, and Bishop Rudy McKissick is one of the most premier um, pastors, preachers, um, well known across the country, um, second to none. Very influential and uh, very uh, astute with social justice and civil rights in the movement, and um, and so. Everybody brings such a value to it, and and I must say, man, you did a wonderful job directing this film, and uh, and you know it's hard to get alpha males together to agree <laughs> on on it. <laughs> wow. But uh, you know, I and and I'm I'm married to an alpha female. She's sitting up here walling her eyes at me now. <laughs> but um. Um, to, to be able to do what we did when I look at, at this film and especially the the revisions that we made and, and how we added 30 minutes to it but then in the editing and how you redid it, um, it it's, it's, it's awesome. It's nothing like it out there. So thank you, thank you, thank you again. 
Well, you're welcome. And thank you for bringing all of us. I'm sure we all would say thank you to be a part of something that touches, yeah, that touches everybody. But, you know, one of the things I noticed that you said, you said that uh, Philando Castell, he motivated you. His, his death motivated you and sparked you to do this project. But he, he also yeah. was, in, he was in Minnesota. So yep. now, most recently, yep. we, we had the uh, George Floyd also in Minnesota. So yep. it's it's like a, I don't want to say full circle because it's not a celebration, but it, it's right back where it started, your your whole motivation. And then you said you were in, yep. yeah, and then you were in D.C. when it came, the thought came to you, right? I was. And now we have the Black Lives Matter mural in D.C. So it seems like that you were pretty much supposed to do this to me. I, that's what I get yeah. out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm also a part of Burke Management. You're right. They did a great job bringing everything together to make this possible. But let me ask you this. The two gentlemen you have here at the top of the screen, you have Reverend Rudolph McKissick. Tell me about him. Tell me what made you bring him. How, what's your relationship with this young man? Well, I, I've been knowing um, uh, uh, the Reverend, right Reverend Dr. Bishop uh, <laughs> <laughs> for um, at, at least 12 years. Uh, we met through a mutual friend, Bishop Lee Alfred Thomas. And uh, and so I, I, I had the, the, uh, the um, awesome uh, opportunity to hear him preach. We were, we were promoting a show in, uh, I believe it was Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, this is about 11, 12 years ago. And I was like, oh, my God, this guy is a monster. He's a beast. And always it's just been a, 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 a pleasure to speak with, very cordial. And I've studied him for years. And, I, you know, I would like to think that I know a lot of people, you know, in, in the uh, in the church world that I could kind of get my hands on and and. Um, but uh, you know, I, I I take back seat to him. I'm I'm, I'm going to be the assistant pastor. He's the, he's the bishop. He he he's far beyond me as, as far as being well connected and and uh, and then like I said, in, in social justice, he 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 is on the board of the National Action Network with Al Sharpton. Um, they work hand in hand, so it's not a um something new to him he's been fighting this fight a long time he and his father um co-pastored for a long time in jacksonville florida which they uh pastored uh or he now is a senior pastor the oldest church in the whole state of florida and it's so much um black history that goes with that story as well too so to have him on on this project as a as a fellow executive producer is is a wonderful wonderful thing it's been a tremendous blessing um and uh, of course harry uh, <laughs> harry is well, let's harry. let's ask him let's, let's, he's, let's, he's a, we're gonna get to harry we'll be here let's uh, mr mckissick how was yes, it how, how was it working i mean y'all know you already knew chad but this project when you find about this project did you, was it a must that you be a part of it? Well, it, it was an absolute must, and I I am indebted uh, to Chad for uh, not only bringing me along, but then introducing me to my wonderful fraternity brother, brother Lennox. You know, we are we are living, especially in the church, in the in the African American church, in it in an age where we now major on prosperity, but minor on the prophetic, where mm -hmm. we're trying to we're trying to teach everybody how to get rich, but not teaching them really how to live or how to manage. Yes. Yes. And we've got a generation growing up of African-American young brothers and sisters who don't know our history and why we still yep. have to be passionate about liberation. Um, and so to watch what Chad did to bridge the history of our heroes and sheroes whose shoulders we stand upon to bridge that gap into contemporaneity and to show us why we are still so serious and why we refuse to just go along to get along and get over it uh, and why we're still passionate about our people and, and how our backs 
and our blood was what built this country. Um, that was passionate for me. And to be able to provide a platform for some of my friends across the country who have great names and great churches and, and put them in a call with Chad to say, hey, as the church being the bedrock of our community, we have to make sure our people are hearing this story that reparations is not something we're just hanging on to. Um, and our equality is not something we're just treating as a fairy tale, that it's very real to us. And why even in modern day, I, I celebrate America's progress, but I still wait on her equality. Yes. This is a very important movie in pushing that. I agree. And you know, and, and this is not nothing this is not nothing new. You you said it just now. You said we're not gonna let up. This has been going on for years. Right. Um, Mr. Lennox, you starred in a film that everybody knows called The Five Heartbeats. Um, that movie was shot, I think, in the ninety early nineties, but it portrayed much earlier in the thirties, I believe, or maybe even I mean the sixties, but maybe even the fifties, I'm not sure exactly. But there was a scene in that movie where you guys got pulled over by the police and you guys were harassed in the movie. And right. that's in the fire heartbeats. And when you watch that scene, no matter who you are, it touches you like just that, that scene alone. But that's a re that's been a reality for years. And, and we're going through that still now today. So, oh, yeah. With that being said, how important is it for you to be involved in a project like this? Well, you know, I think that uh, all of us right now want to be contributing to what good changes may be happening here. And I think that, um, you know, I've, I've been calling this a singularity. That is, uh, mm -hmm. in, in physics, a singularity is, is a point at which something receives an infinite value, like gravity reaches an infinite value. And then all of the mathematical rules break down and it becomes a new reality. And I think that this is a singularity. It took it took 400 years, but for some reason, the George Floyd event, um, you know, really sparked something, which I think that uh, probably because of when it happened uh, with, in the pandemic and all of these things with yeah. this president in office, I don't think this would be happening with the Democrat in office, to be honest with you. And I don't think we would be in a position to a certain extent to be uh, to be in a good place to maybe get some of these things we've been asking for or to take some of these things we've been asking for. But that said, uh, I, I, I want to do something. I don't think that, you know, for me, um, I, I've been in a, lots of movements, lots of marches, lots of protests and all of this stuff. But my way really to contribute now is artistically. And so when Chad, you know, came up with this idea, it, 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 you know, the bishop provided some very excellent sort of sociological and religious framework to this mm -hmm. as artists as people who create art i think it's important for us to be able to uh, provide an artistic element to it i think one of the things I, and i think both of these are sorely needed right now there's not nearly enough spirituality being discussed uh, okay. within this present framework where's god in this conversation I, I find it very missing and then where's the artistic expression in the conversation what i love about what chad did in the writing is that he provided a kind of uh, a therapy by letting the elders speak to be given a platform where they can actually contextualize what is happening right now and see that it was in a context. It comes not in a vacuum, but these mm -hmm. people deserve to be heard because they are very much, you know, a part of the conversation now. To some extent, even, you know, I, I, you know, not to go too far with it, but those statues in Richmond and all this stuff, which is coming yeah. down, great. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's happening. But on another level, those people, Christopher Columbus, George Washington, uh, uh, all the people who, uh, whose, whose record should be looked at, explain why we are here. And I almost would prefer if not tearing those things down, but adding the context to what that kind of thinking created, what that reality created. What is the result of Robert E. Lee? We should be That's able right. to see that and not try to erase what actually happened or those things could be put to another place. But let's not erase it. Let's talk about it. We can't erase the results of it. We can't erase what uh, what, what what happened to our people. Uh, because there was a Robert E. Lee in a civil war and a civil rights movement and Jim Crow. And so I think what, what, what is beautiful about 
movie is that we do get to see all of these things and actually find a solution. What is the yes. solution for black people? And reparations is very much uh, a part of that. That's what we deserve. Somebody worked for free under brutal conditions and the, mm. the impact of that is still currently felt by all these billionaires and trillionaires, most of whom don't look like the people who did the actual work. And that needs to be corrected. And right. so I, that's what I love about, you know, Chad put a, a number on that. Uh, it's probably not even that is not enough. But yeah, uh, but I'm glad, but that's a good start point. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, thank you. Definitely, for, definitely. For inviting me. Yeah, I think the number goes up with inflation. It, it definitely, definitely <laughs> should. Yeah. So we speak about the elders that were in the film that, you know, touched on a lot of things that we actually have. Todd, I'm sorry to call you an elder, but man, you started so young in the game. <laughs> yeah. We, we got to call you an elder right now. But I got to say, man, working with you and, and actually, you know, on set with you was, like I told you before, to your face. It was actually a dream. To work with somebody, I appreciate it. My mother used to treat me like you, like literally. I had a young brother, <laughs> so she used to treat me like Willis. Like, mama, I'm not Willis, I'm a, but it, whatever. Hey, so, hey, man, so, I, yeah, man, see, now, say this. Now, <laughs> yeah. We, we all wanted to be Willis. Th that's what <laughs> I wanted. To be. Yeah. <laughs> that's see, see the, th the thing for me that made me want to really do this show was because I experienced all the stuff that people didn't realize. I was getting pulled over every single day. It started when I was 12 years old and moved to San Fernando Valley. I was getting guns put to my head by police officers, taking my bike, telling me I stole it. Um, I was being handcuffed on the ground, shotguns to my head. I went through everything that people don't realize. I went through so much by these white racist people in the valley. Um, they burned a cross on my lawn, you know. Um, at one time, they tried to arrest me for stealing my own car. And then actually, what, what saved my life was these two black officers came to my mom's house and said, Todd needs to leave town now because they're talking in roll call, they're going to kill him. So I, I went to Jamaica for two months because I was on hiatus. I went to Jamaica and they kicked my door into my house. They came and arrested my bodyguard, but I wasn't there. They told me they had key witnesses that saw me shoot my gun in, in inside somebody's house. But then I was, I've been in Jamaica for two months, so that was a mighty long gun that, that had happened. You know what I mean? And if somebody can make a gun like that, then hey, we can win a lot of wars. You know, so for me, <laughs> doing this was felt really good. I needed to do this to tell more of the story. If people don't really understand my story, they they know the bad days, but they don't know how that bad days ended up that way. They don't, you know, when you when you growing up, I grew up in San Francisco when everything was like peaceful. Everybody got along. You know, it was like no no bad interactions with police, no bad interaction, bad interaction with white people. But when I moved to L.A., man, it was a culture shock, man. You know, I never experienced racism. I didn't know what slavery was till I was in Roots. Mm. You know what I mean? That's how crazy that was, you know? And then I was, you know, always the first black on every show. And my dressing was always the furthest away than everybody, too. That's always how it was, you know? Um, my mom my mom told me this one story where I was a star of this, sh this movie that I was doing for one of these networks. And this white kid was on for three days, and he was making seven times more than me. Wow. Wow. See, and that's how they did us, you know, and they get mad at me when I speak up because I, you know, it came to the point to where I became defiant with the police. You understand what I mean? So much, it was, they, they had to mess with me so many times that I was done. I wasn't going to take it no more. I was going to speak up and tell them how I felt, you know, and, um, you know, I'm blessed that they didn't kill me, you know, but they, they became very afraid of me because I sued them and I won. You know, I went and I always, whenever they miss me, I go after them, you know, and then, so then, but what happened was emotionally, I broke down, you know, then I started losing it and, you know, I got on drugs, so I couldn't handle all the pressure that was happening, had nothing to do with show business, had everything to do with what was happening to me outside of show business, because nobody was believing me. When I was telling them what was going on, they didn't believe me that I was lying. You know, that's back when they thought police raised their hand and said, I'll tell the truth, and they did. You know, now we know they don't tell the truth. They lie like anybody else, you know, but what I'm trying to get people to understand that there are a lot of good officers, but they got to stop turning a blind eye to the bad ones. You know, that's what's hurting us. You know, they're letting the bad ones continue to keep doing what they're doing. They got to they got to get them out of there. You know, if they want to if they want to be treated like, you know, like everybody else. But justice on trial by seeing that, man, it brought me to to my life. 
what I went through. You know, it was like I should have been up there telling the story of what I went through and what I had to go through to get to where I got to. You know, I'm blessed to be alive, man. I'm blessed to be healthy. I'm blessed to be alive. I'm blessed that they didn't kill me because they sure tried on plenty of occasions, you know. And, um, you know, it's just a wonderful thing, you know, to be able to work and do his play and be involved in that, man, and, and work with man. You know, it was just wonderful, you know. And, you know, then I see other people involved, other black actors that I respect. Like, you know, man, I respect you so much, man, watching you work. It's just amazing, man, you know. I love watching talented people work, you know. And I started at such a young age, you know, doing shows before, you know, like at one point, I was the only black kid on TV. You know, it was me and Kim Fields. That was it. You couldn't see nobody else, you know. But they didn't understand what we had to go through, you know, what we had to deal with. No one knew that. You know, because that was all hidden on the side. But I had a great time, man, doing Justice on Trial, man. I did, man. I had a great time because I got to play that lawyer. And, you know, what you didn't understand was I was, was really mad when I was playing that lawyer. That's why I was so good. <laughs> it was coming from the heart. Because <laughs> I wanted some reparation what they did to me. You know what I mean? You know? So it worked out great for me because, you know, it was like you picked the right person. I was like, yeah, I'm mad anyways. I can do this let's roll real well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it came out great. So I had a great time, man, working with everybody. It was, it was a lot of fun, man. It really was. Oh, hey Todd, I gotta ask you this now. You mm -hmm. you you went to church with me uh, that Sunday after we oh, yeah. filmed, and man, it said the same thing too. And you said to me, you said, "I've never met anybody like you." <laughs> oh no, yeah, I hadn't. And, and you said you're like a drug dealer, but you're selling something good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what, yeah. It was like, boy, he knew he knew how to go into a church and. Start selling them tickets. I was like, man, you like you like a drug dealer in here, man. And they just buying it up, you know. And, and but it's good, and it, but but the good part about it, it's a good product. You know what I mean? It wasn't some bad some bad thing. Was bad. He sold a good product, and he did a good job at doing it. You know, I love it when somebody can use their warm their mouth to talk and talk really well, but can but honest about it. You know what I mean? I love to see that, man, because there's so many brothers who can do all that talking, but they always use it for bad. You know what I mean? They don't use it for good. You know, he used this for good, and that's what I loved about it. I yeah. appreciate that. Appreciate you're right. It. No and problem. You're right. I said it too, and, and I feel the same way. And Ty, you're right too. It's for good, and huh? that's what that's what this film is. This film is for good. Yep. So, Ty, yep. you, be, you being a, a, a younger person going through what you went through, how do you think this movie will help the younger generation? Not just the police officers, but the young people, citizens that need to learn as well. I think that a lot, a lot of the young people haven't see what I get upset about is watching a young person start talking about stuff that they ain't went through yet. You know what I mean? Oh, they they just only see in a small portion of what we actually saw. You know what I mean? What we actually went through. I think it's gonna help a lot for them to under, really understand what really happened to a lot of people. What what we really when we would go when they would go to court that they would get away with it constantly. They think they got away with stuff now. They really got away with it then. You know, wow. and um, I think it's a necessary move for young people to see to really start to understand their roots and what needs to be done. You know, but we do know we cannot do it without their help. We need them white people's help. We need their help. We can't do it without them. And it's time for them to stop turning a blind eye because here's what's going to happen. If they don't start helping when they need help, we're not going to be there to help them. That's the bottom line. You know, it's that old story where they come for one person, they come for the next person, nobody wants to help, and then all of a sudden, when you need help, ain't nobody there to help you. Yep, that's a proven fact as well. Yep. So, Chad, Chad, what else do you have in yeah. store? What do you? What's next for Justice on Trial for the for the film? Well, um, Harry and I, we we've talked about um, doing some TV series. Um, you know, both of us have a, a lot of content um, that can really keep this, you know, ongoing. So um, that that's one aspect. And, and, and you you know this, man, the way the movie ends now. And Todd, you don't know it. And, 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 and McKissick, you don't know it because you haven't seen the revised version. But Harry knows it because I've told him about it. It leaves it where it can be a sequel. Wow. So, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do we get the money ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be in the sequel. <laughs> okay. Right. All right. All right. Because right. you know, because I, I was look, I was looking for my four acres and a mule, and I still ain't got that. 
You know, <laughs> I, I take the forty acres. I may have to eat the mule. You know, but you know, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so talks about maybe doing a TV series uh, with Justice on trial. Uh, what about the play? Are you going to keep doing the play? Is the play still living? I would love to keep doing the play um, when this coronavirus. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Todd, Todd, Todd's been to the play. He knows the kind of energy. The play mm -hmm. is, you know, theater and film are two different ball games. And uh, yeah, but the the the, the, the res audience response with the play is it's amazing, man. It's, it, it, is, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> Okay, so listen, we have a very uh, another very good point here. Todd just said that white people have to help us, right? We can't do it without them, right? So in the film, the antagonist is, is is Caucasian, but the actual hero is Caucasian as well. We can't get them on something going on te technically with, with his system. But can you tell us, uh, Mr. Cooper, on having a Caucasian uh, spit? I actually spit the knowledge that he spit and play that character so well. Well, what what John Gesman uh, plays um, Todd's partner, um, attorney in the um, in the movie, mm -hmm. and he was seventy four years old, never acted before, because he happens to be my dad's best friend, who's a real mm -hmm. lawyer. Um, and after having met with him and talked with him, I was like, man, this guy is perfect for the role because it, it would be natural. And uh, so the passion that he brought to it and just the and so, and subtle subtle comedy as well, <laughs> because mm -hmm. we, added, we added a house scene and, uh, and he thought he was gonna have to take a shower scene. <laughs> we was like, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but but he is a wealth of knowledge. Just just a, just 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 his brain is uh, just so. <laughs> the guy is brilliant, and so mm -hmm. he, he 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 spits knowledge out when it comes to reparations and social justice. And it's not a, that that part's not an act. It, it's what it is, and I I think he's gonna be a breakout star in this this movie at seventy four years old, which says it's never too late. Yeah, you know some Harry Harry. You said some interesting, and I think you're right about that. But when they remove those statues, they need to put them in a museum. So we don't forget. Don't we don't need to see them on the street, but move them to a museum so we can go in there and remind, remind, remind ourselves what this was like. You know. Yep. But I don't think they should be in the streets. Where we got to see them every day. But move them to a museum so we don't forget that history. So we don't repeat that. You know. I, I do agree that that they should be moved to a museum. I do agree with that. Move them to a museum. Yeah. You no, know, let people I, see that. Yep. You know. Yeah, uh, I, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, you know censorship in any form isn't, I, I don't like it because I think yeah, to your point, yeah. Todd, when you were saying, when, when somebody says, hey, where are, who's going to be there when it's your turn to be called up the country? That's right. That's uh, right. We need to, actually, we need less censorship. We need more, like, I don't mm -hmm. think it's right for Facebook to go around blocking some people and not blocking others. Right. Who gets to make that decision? Exactly. Right? What if I say something exactly. that Facebook doesn't agree with? Right. Yeah. You know? Right. And uh, anyway, yeah. So I, you, you and I are there. By the way, you know, I know everybody. You, you know, uh, everybody's talking about something they saw you in when you were a young actor. I saw you in an episode that I'll never forget of Little House on the Prairie. Oh, and I and, 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 and I tell you, it, it was you remember that Cooper? I and remember then, that. Yeah, yeah. You're you know you're an incredible talent, and uh, and I'm glad to be in association with you. Thank you, man. Yeah. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I tell you, that, them, I them, them, them words, the words that I asked Michael Landon, but blew him up, didn't it? He could not answer that hey. question. <laughs> and, and, and it's a question that no white man could ever answer. You What's, the question? Well, I, What's the question? What's, what's the, the question was this. I, I, said, I, said, I said, answer me something, sir. I said, would you like to live to be 100? He said, well, yeah, I'd like to. I said, well, you, would you like to be, live to be black and live to be 100 or white and live to be 50? And that music said, ba -da 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 -da. he was like, mm. and you know, he was not going to say black. You know that. He was not going to say that. Wow. Uh, well, wow. hey, Todd, I, I want to yeah. ask you this, though. What was your what was your favorite role as a child out of all of the roles that you it was It was Little House in the Prairie. Because wow. Wow. I really, yeah. I really got, so got to, to really throw down in that and really, really throw out 
the feeling that I was going through at the time that I was seeing stuff that I shouldn't have been seeing and that was the discrimination I was seeing. And to be on a show that had never cast black people on was a truly amazing in the very beginning anyway. You know, and it set a standard because I ran away from my family to learn how to read and write. But I didn't understand the reality of what I was doing. And the reality was it was not going to teach no black kid how to read and write. But Michael Landon took me in and said I was like from from, a, from a, uh, somebody he was with and drew Laura Ingalls nuts, drew them crazy, made them go crazy. But at the same time, I realized I had to go back home because I had to be with my mom and my, and my brother and I shouldn't have left wow. because now I understand what's going on. When I met the doctor, he was on the doctor of Indians and he really let, he really explained to me, they're not going to let you be no doctor for no white man, boy. You know, and I was like, and I understood it fine. And I realized that was time for me to go home. And I, I love that role. That role really was a good role, man. Really was. With the, you know, yeah. these, those are yeah. life. That's a life changing role. That yeah, would never get old. It'll never get. Yeah, old. what? What? It, 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 it was like on Twitter just a couple of months, weeks ago. It was like trending like crazy on Twitter. Is that right? All this stuff happened. Okay. Yeah, and then okay. all this okay. stuff happened. I was like, oh my god! I hope the show didn't do that. <laughs> but but it blew it up. It was all over Twitter, and people I, I, was like, man, because it's very I relevant to this know. very day. Yeah, it is. I also is. remember yeah. you doing a a, a role. Um, you you all dealt with discrimination and racism on different strokes. Yeah, we sure did. We sure did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We and, and we actually did a blackface on that because I'll tell you what I happened. What happened that. was the guy. Yeah, the guy was upset because we were black. So Kimberly came down and said, "I'm actually black," and he was like, "Huh?" You know, what I mean, he was blown up behind that. You know, wow. see, I think there's certain. See, our show, different strokes changed the face of television it made yeah. people you know and that show was different because everybody watched it which was amazing because usually yeah. it didn't happen like that and for me i got to meet all my idols because um uh, norman lear owned it but he also owned Sam and son i got to read red fox sherman hemsley everybody all them shows were all owned by norman lear that yeah. had black people on it and the ones that didn't have black people on it norman lear didn't own so that's what was the different part about it so every time you saw a black person on the show, they were usually owned by Norman Lear. And that was wow. Wow. I was thinking about him. He did those kind of shows. Yep. Amazing. Now, Todd, you 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 on your role, and man, you don't mind me asking the question, do you? Because I know this <laughs> no. is your show. <laughs> no, <I'm sure. laughs> you you interviewed this guy right here. Um he played Emmett Till. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chad the second. Uh, How you doing, man? Like? What was that like? Like, like, I, like I said, interviewing him and seeing him the way he was, like I said, it brought back the time that they had shotguns to my head and that they wanted, they wanted to kill me, you know? So I felt for him at that moment. And it made me, like by doing, it made me feel for everybody that was in that that had gone through something. It really made me feel because it brought back some stuff that happened to me, you know? You know, I mean, I used to have to bring, check this out. I used to have to bring a, a second pair of clean clothes in my car because I knew I was gonna get pulled over on the way to work. It was just a matter of time. They'd be going the opposite direction. They see me, they whiz around, pull me over, get me out with a shotgun under my head to the ground. I'm dirtying up my clothes. So I knew by the time I get to work, I just go change clothes and I go just go change clothes with clean clothes. I had to do that for like four years straight. I had to do that for them. But the good thing that what happened was Every single one of those officers that did me that way ended up working for the Rampart Division and they all got fired. Mm. And guess what I did? I sent them all an autograph picture and said, I still got my job. You got yours? <laughs> 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 I got them back good, boy. Yeah, you That's did. Awesome. Very good. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought up uh, Chad Jr. Uh, well, he, 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 he's, yeah. he's gone. He's gone yeah. on here. So. I did not know, and, and forgive me for not knowing this, I haven't seen a movie in a long time, that you were in Roots. I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know, yeah. Or, or, or I forgot, either or. So you've already been in a historical uh, movie on, yes. on, on this type of... 77 uh, million people, man, watched that. That was that was one of the first... It was like, it was like a, it, we ran out of black people in Hollywood. That's the funny part. They ran out of black people. Okay, mm. I played... I was a lead role, and they didn't have too many black kids. I played an extra role several times because they made me go, they got to go way in the back, Todd, and just wear some clothes and we can't see your face. So, because they ran out of black people. 
And then I got to tell you the funniest part about Roots. Here's the fun part. It made me laugh. Okay. You know, we had to be barefooted, right? And you got a bunch of black actors who ain't used to being barefooted, right? So they first, they said, okay, they came. When they first started, they go, okay, we're going we're gonna to run over here. Action. Everybody's like, up, 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 up. They said, cut. They said, man, y'all got to do something about this. This rocks hurt. So what they end up doing was making us some fake feet. Some, you know, the, you know over our, under our feet, some, some, some rubber soles that glued to our feet. That was the only oh, way wow. we could run on the ground, man. Because, you know, I had no, no slave feet. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I had real feet that hurt. You know, because, you know, you watch them Africans, they run around with no shoes on. They ain't yeah. they don't care. Yeah. White people do too. They be having lady out there on the street. I be like, oh, no, nah, I can't do that. I hit a rock. I'm, I'm done. I'm done for the day. Well, that's that's funny, man. We keep losing Cooper, man. I wanted to talk about the the Harriet Tubman and the, the Mega Evers and the yep. Emmett Till that were, they were in the film. And, you know, Amart Arbery, I'm here in Georgia. That happened in Georgia before the George Floyd and before the, the new case again in Georgia, the Mr. Brooks from a couple of nights ago. But that uh, Amart Arbery was very similar to, to the Emmett Till. I mean, they didn't kidnap yeah. him, but yeah. it was close. And they, and they and they took his life and you know and we are that was with the 1950s. You talking 60 something years later, and we're still having that type of issue. And yeah, then, and now and now we're hearing that the fact that several times they had several encounters with that man and the the DA didn't press charges. Now see, she needs to be arrested too, right along yeah. with that. With they, she needs to go to jail too. Now well, you don't press charges on the, all the criminal act behavior this man has done to black people. She need to go to charge. She need to go to prison too. It ain't right, yeah. but she needs to. I agree, and that's the same thing. What I'm saying with the Emmett Till, they didn't yep. try him because they had people yep. that let him go. Yep. And yep. So, and I, and I think now, uh, I think we got Harry back on. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Okay. We got Harry back on. I know Mr. Cooper is not back on. Let me text him here and see. But what we're touching on is the the Emmett Till similarities to the Ahmad Aubrey uh, case. And how do we get past that? Like, is, is, is convicting the officers and the DA enough for us? Are we satisfied with that? You know what I'm saying? So since it's so similar to what happened to Emmett Till, I mean, what do you guys think? I think, you know, it, it may satisfy that as an instant, but it cannot satisfy us overall. I, I think getting a conviction shows progress. But I think we then have to examine and talk about the lessons we need to learn from why this was even happening. Yeah. I think that's the part we're missing. We, we, we are looking for, um, for, I don't want to say revenge, but we're, we're looking for payback, but we're not getting educated. Yeah. Got to yeah. Con- James Baldwin said, you can't fix what you won't face. And wow. even getting a conviction does not make them face their racism at, right. at, as as a whole in this country. Well, yeah, but that but see what I'm and what I'm seeing until what I'm seeing with, education. Good. See what I'm seeing the people out there though, I'm seeing faces that I've never seen before out there marching with people. I'm seeing now that something's happening. Something's happening more than I've ever seen in my entire life. Something's happening. I think change is coming. Because something is happening. But they are it, out, they're out there yeah, marching with us this now gonna, and really fighting back. This is going to sound bad, especially as a preacher. But I'm seeing a lot of whites out there. And my issue is, I don't want your sympathy. I want your change. Well, yeah, yeah. But you I know? think that the, the younger generation, I think they are they they want the change also. Cause my, you know, like like my kids, they don't see what we what we see. Like I, I I'm not gonna lie, I do see color, but my kids, them, they, they, my kids don't. They don't see that. Their friends, every color, they don't see what they don't see what we see. You know what yeah. I mean? You know, well, the only reason I see it is because everything I went through. So of course I'm gonna see it. You know what I mean? But right. they, he sees different stuff, and and I think this new generation with these young kids, they want, they're not doing what their parents want. They want change. They want everyone to be equal. And that, you know, that's going to take, you know, you know, they're stubborn to do that. That's going to take some, some, some fighting. We know that it's going to take it. We deserve to be treated like human beings. You know, well, let, it, me, it, let me say you know? this too. 
I, I think so, you know, when it comes to a real uh, apology, a real change, that's like if I if I if I wreck your car, if I hit your car and I just get out and I say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. That's not fixing the issue. That, this is where reparations comes in. If I hit your car and mess it up and I get out and I say, I'm sorry, let's find the body shop and let me pay for it because I've cost you damages, then that's fixing the problem. That's a real apology. And so I think to the marching is great. The protesting is great. But the, 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 the reality of it is what comes next. Um, we, we, can't, we can't move forward until we deal with the damage that's been done in the past. Right. So, so yeah. So that that, 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 that that's that's that. I believe that is true. But I also believe that you know, you're gonna have to give them a chance because first of all, I've noticed most countries that have done damage to the people have said they're sorry. Have you noticed that? Like like uh, Australia mm -hmm. said sorry to the, what they did to the indigenous people. They apologized and, and started giving doing things for them more and more a lot more. But this country owes too many people. Think about it. You well, know how many people they owe in this country? How many people they didn't did did in? Absolutely, but if you know that- In America, they, they didn't did in a lot of people. So the, how do they make reparation to the Indians, to the Chinese, to the well, blacks? They you know, how, how do they do that? They've given reparations to the Indians. They've given reparations to the Chinese Americans. We're the only race of people that they have given no reparations to. I mean, I well, take the money, I ain't gonna lie. But the question is, how much? In. Let me chime in for a second. Mm -hmm. So my, my my view on racism is this, and y'all can agree with me, can, whatever. My mm -hmm. is this, I don't care in my mind if a citizen is racist. That's your point, sort of like what Harry said. If that's your feeling, go ahead, that's your feeling. I could care yeah. less. What bothers me, and it, about, about, uh, it bothers most people is when you are a government figure, whether it's a police officer or lawyer, yeah. doctor, who, somebody an authoric figure, and you have a right to make a decision that affects my life in some type of way, and you're racist. That's my problem. That's my issue. Yeah, I don't care. I, I, I don't care. That. I don't care if the people protesting are out there and they're racist. So what? That doesn't matter. You're not affecting my my what my the decisions that mess with my life. So when we say America owes so many people, we're saying government. We're not saying Americans. And yeah, we're, we're, we're saying government. government. We are. We're saying government. Right. That's exactly so, right. That's so if you're, the if you're the government and you and you're a, a doctor or excuse me, not a doctor, but if you're somebody in that, even a doctor that can save your life and do, doesn't want to do it because of the color of your skin or something like that, that's the issue, and that's what we need to target. So an apology from the American government would be great. Unfortunately, the person that's in the chair is not going to do that. No. If there was, if there was, yeah. If there was somebody else in the chair that was rational, that wasn't cuckoo, they could easily. So hear, hear me all the way out. So we go. Right. Let's go. Let's go to penalties right now. Let's go to what we said before about being prosecuted, right? So the laws were actually made up by the people that they made the laws, right? But yes. The, but the penalties are meant to be examples for everybody else who thinks they're going to make the same crime and they're going to say. Well, I'm not even going to do that because I can get 25 years of life. So mm -hmm. we have to convict the officers on a higher scale, especially now. So if they are racist and if they don't think that Mayor Robinson's or Chad Jr.'s life matters before they pull the trigger, say it matters not to me. doesn't matter if it matters to you. It matters if it matters to his mother, his sister, his brother, whoever else that's, that's right. waiting for him to come that's home. Right. That's when it matters. So if you put a high penalty on that officer, whoever it is right now, then they would double think about certain things. Racists can't stop somebody. Well, that's from right. Racist, but you can stop them from acting on it. Well, it, that's my point. That's, it was like it was like the the, girl, the woman in Texas that walked into that black man's apartment was not even her apartment. She only gets ten years. Yeah. Like, wait a minute, that was not her apartment. That so was the time to give a, that that was the time yeah, to a great example. That's when they should exactly. have gave a book at her. Because exactly. Just because you, exactly. So you say I can walk into somebody's somebody's house and say, well, I think it's my apartment and shoot them? You know what I mean? But, Is that what you're saying? That goes back to systemic racism and, yes. the, and, and the inequality yeah. of, of uh, just being black in America. 
it's the justice system though that treats us differently than it treats them. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. a fact, you know. Just like you know, we had we had in California, we had a little white kid in California. To check this out, he was drinking and he killed four people in the car. He was and his parents were rich. They made up a new law called the influenza law where he was so rich he didn't understand what he was doing. He turns around. Yeah, he turns around, gets caught drinking again on the internet. His mother grabs him and flees to Mexico. They catch him, yeah. bring him back, and he only does two years. And the mother, nothing happens to the mother. Now, you tell me if that would have been the black people. First of all, the black kid would have been doing life. He would have never even got out of that. Well, you know course. what I mean? But they're going to change the law because he's rich. He didn't know what he was doing. He well, knew what he was seen, doing. We've seen several videos where white people fight cops. They hit cops. They do everything. Oh, yeah. I've seen they that. They shoot them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I got. But I, I, have, got, I have seen him shot, though. I've seen a few of them shot. Yeah, I've seen the one in that hotel. They could do him dirty. Yeah, they remember that? Him. Yeah, that was woo. That was dirty. Him dirty. But the problem is, see, I'm gonna tell you what, I, what what the problem really is. It's the news media. The news media don't show what happens to them. Only shows what happens to us. And I think that's where the big racial divide happens. If the news media would tell the truth and show what's happening to them. And us at the same time, things a lot more things would change because they'd be like, man, they killing white people too. You know, they would change a lot of stuff. You see what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is, they only show us. Yeah, that's the now, sad part. Now, now, Chad too played Emmett Till. Um, mm -hmm. You're a college student, 19 years old. You speak to a generation that that um, that you know, man's probably the oldest one on here. That old folks like man can uh, uh, identify <laughs> with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be surprised. What do you I feel about racism my phone in the American justice system? Uh, the way that I feel about race and the justice system, I feel like there's a lot of systemic racism. Um, and I feel like African Americans have gotten to a point where we're tired of just being congenial and having redness, redness with the American government. And so it's gotten to the point where people are upset and they're angry because this is not just something that happened a year ago it's not something that just happened 10 years ago this progressively happens all the time and it continuously happens i mean it's like a new case of a new black man or a black woman killed every year that we're looking at you know that we're looking at especially in my generation even remembering trayvon martin dying um that was like the first one for us and i know that you guys have like even rodney king getting beat up and with the LA riots, but my first experience that I heard with police brutality with the black man was with Trayvon Martin. And I remember how scared I was at that moment. And throughout the years, especially throughout the 2010s, it just got progressively worse. And to the point where George Floyd, if a man can sit on somebody's neck for eight minutes and nobody's trying to do anything about it, and nobody thinks there's, and then there's some people who are defending his actions, that says a lot about America. And it says a lot about how people feel yep. even about African Americans and how we are mistreated in this country. So I feel like my generation, we feel the pain, we feel the shackles of our ancestors. We feel that because we can still see that it can happen today, but except they just try to hide it, which is why it's systemic racism. They want it, they're being racist, but they're saying they're not racist. Why is over 40% of the prison population filled up with African American men? So what does the movie mm -hmm. say to you? Um, the, what the movie says to me is that I think it's going to educate a lot of people who are in my generation and even a lot of people who are in your generation or even older than that, because I think African-Americans never got to know a lot of our history. I, I didn't even find out about Tulsa, what happened in Tulsa until the movie, um, actually until the play. So I didn't even know about these things because we didn't learn about them in school. So I think this is an educational tool for African-Americans to use to teach their kids about their history. Also to teach them about what we can do for in the future with activism, with um, even trying to act, um, use that to help get reparations in some type of way. And it doesn't even have to be through money or about through education or um helping instead of just gentrifying the neighborhoods, how about renovating them and putting programs to establish young African-American youth to be able to go through different avenues like businesses and, um, you know, things of that sort. Man, so, I mean, I'm glad you know about, about, about 19, you know, 1921 in, in uh, Tulsa, because I'd be preaching that to everybody. I'd be letting everybody know that that could have changed the history of black Americans. 
If that would have not happened, we'd be in a different position, completely be in a different position. But they made sure that didn't happen. The anniversary as well. The anniversary yeah. was just, I think, a week ago. Yep. And, so. and he was about to, about to go have a speech there, but I think he changed when he realized that that may be costly for him. You know, somebody was going to go crazy because that I was mad at, mad when I found out he was going to go speak there. I'm like, man, you don't belong there. Racist, race person does not belong there. You didn't done enough damage over there. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, not only Tulsa Rosewood, another one, went through there and just wiped him out. So I have a question for for Chad Jr. I know y'all see this box on my face. Ignore that. Chad, so when you, Chad Jr., so when you were playing Emmett, I mean, how does that feel? I mean, actor, you're actor, we know that, but we just heard Todd say that, you know, he was that, he felt it. That's why he did such a good de- uh, job. When you were playing Emmett, like, how did you feel? Did you feel the pain from him or? Well, playing that role, and I've always told people that since I even began playing the role, it was, it's like, it's not me. I feel like I am Emmett Till when I'm playing that role because I can't really remember anything while I was even doing the production on stage. I never even remembered really anything while being on stage. And even before I did the role um, in the movie, I remember before it was my time to go on set, I was just praying and I was like, God, please let the spirit of Emmett Till just move over my body so I can tell this story correctly. And so playing the role, it was it takes a toll on me because I have to put myself in the position of being 14 years old and having to be brutally murdered because you're a black. And so I think this is going to touch a lot of people who are teenagers and specifically black teenagers. And it's like, wow, because this is still happening today, even with Trayvon, when it happens, Trayvon or George Floyd. So. Yeah, well, you did a great job, and you know, don't be don't be too humble. You, you can sing too. You you did the, you know, you did a song in the film. You know, you you're blessed with the same singing skills as your parents. So I can't wait to. That's one of my favorite parts, actually. Um, but yeah. but your mom was in it as well. She played Harriet Tubman, and yes, sir. you know that is definitely. I don't know if she's available to speak on that role, or if you want to speak for her, or your father wants to speak for her, but. She also delivered a performance that was just, we felt like she was here. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, she, she, she takes that, um, that role um, and, and, and breathes a, a modern day life <laughs> to it. Um, what you would consider, uh, think of Harriet being, you know, if she, if she would just a person and, um, and so it, it's always good. It started with the play, uh, of course, and, and 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 she took it to the big screen the same way, um, and because Harriet, we we personally know Harriet's nephew, a great nephew, Harriet raised Dr. A. D. Brickler, uh, by the way, McKissick that lives in Tallahassee. Uh-huh. He's a he's a doctor. That's Harriet Tugman's great great nephew, and Harriet Tugman raised his mother until she was thirteen. Well, his son, who is Harriet Tugman's great great nephew, Dr. A.J. Brickler, is my daughter's godfather. Oh, wow. And uh, we're very good friends. And, and they they came and they, we filmed some footage uh, for uh, when we were doing a docu- documentary, rather, on uh, on the play. And, um, um, and he shared some information with me that Harriet Tugman actually loved to sing. Her favorite song was "Go Down Moses," and, uh, and so we had a little insight of her personality. So we were able to add some things to it, um, and she did. She does a wonderful job in that. Yeah, she, she definitely did. And we actually coming to the end of the show, but I want to touch on two quick things. You also had your brother and your father uh, in the film. Uh, Mr. Mr. Loopy actually played the judge, who was also a real judge, a real federal judge. And then also great. your brother who played Mega Evers, um, and he did a great job as well. And we don't want to give it away, but it's a very dramatic scene for Mr. Evers. Um, yeah. So especially, can, especially the addition that that we added to it. Yeah, it's very very powerful. I see it every day. I'll let you see it when I finish. How's that? How's that? <laughs> so so we have to close it out. What's going on an hour? But tell us where they can see the film. Uh, everybody can chime in on you know their social medias if they like and go from there 
Mr. Cooper? Well, the, the best way to see the film is to pre-order it now by going to justiceontrialthemovie.com, justiceontrialthemovie.com, and purchase pre-order. It's uh, the 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 pre the pay per view is nineteen ninety five. If you do it in advance, it's fourteen ninety five. And uh, so go ahead and do it in advance and be prepared to watch it all day uh, from 12.01 a.m. on July the 4th, which is considered Independence Day. But we, 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 we're we celebrating it a different way, making it an I-Independence Day. And um, and so uh, that's the, the platform to to get the movie on. Also, the Chad Cooper Company dot com. And also we we. We also have another movie revival, themovie.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Harry and I have talked about that with you on this platform before, and, and we're continuing to show that. So you'll see that um, on, uh, on, on all of our websites as well. So um, that's an ongoing movie that we're doing. But Justice on Trial, we're asking everybody to make plans to watch it. Tell, the, tell your friends and family share it justice on trial the movie.com i believe it's a game changer it's it's educational motivational and inspirational so thanks again man for all that you do with black film.com and um we're looking forward to some more greatness yeah and you're, you're correct so black film.com is a sponsor of the show and will be on their website this episode will air the day before your or maybe two days before your your showing of your film, so all the audience or will know to go there and see this great interview. Um, and we want to thank all the guests for coming out: Ty Bridges, Mr. Harry Lennox, uh, Rudolph McKenzie. We appreciate you, and we're going to repeat what you just said: motivational, inspirational, and educational. That's the way we roll. You understand? So thanks again for coming out, and we'll see you. God bless. Take care, oh, Harry. Take care, guys. God bless, God bless everybody. Take care, guys. Yes, sir. What, what's Kill Patrick? Kwame son, oldest son, what, one of his twin sons, is also oh. in one of the add on scenes of this the particular movie. I uh, actually uh, yeah. directed this film, and I'm telling you right now, that guy can act. I didn't see any bad acting in this whole film. Just wanted to let you guys know that. Good. We okay. appreciate that. Bad. All right. See you. God bless you Love guys. Peace you. out. Definitely. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Behind the Scenes with Man Robinson. Our aim is to genuinely encourage and inspire you with the compelling stories and content we provide in hopes that you'll inspire others. For info on upcoming episodes and all things surrounding film, techniques, and motivation, follow at Man Robinson on all social platforms. View on blackfilm.com, manrobinson.org, or stream anytime on Spotify and iTunes. 